Hey everyone. Today I'd like to show you something that's surprising about some ionic compounds. This is an example of an ionic compound, copper 2 sulfate, which has copper ions as the cation and sulfate ions as its anion. And it appears blue because of the copper ions, which typically give us blue or bluish green photons of light. I want to light my Bunsen burner and put this in the Bunsen burner and show you what happens. Okay, so the copper 2 sulfate crystals are going to go into my Bunsen burner flame. And as I'm heating it, something interesting is happening. Uh, first of all, you might be able to see that there's a color change happening. Some of those crystals are turning from blue to white, slowly. You might also hear something happening as well. There's a little hissing noise coming from the end of the test tube. But also notice what else, what else is happening. There is some smoke or steam coming out of the top of the test tube. And, oh wow, and there's some liquid in there. There's some condensation happening in that middle of the test tube there. So the only thing I added to my test tube was those crystals of copper two sulfate. But after I heated them, I got all of this condensation happening and some steam coming out the top. Where did that come from? Because ionic compounds typically form crystals. Some ionic compounds though, have spaces between the ions that are big enough for little water molecules to get caught inside. So a hydrated ionic compound is an ionic compound with water trapped in its crystals. Here are several sulfate compounds that are also hydrates. This one is aluminum ammonium sulfate with 12 waters of hydration. They're not always that big. This one only has seven. Ferric sulfate has five over here. And we have manganese sulfate with just one water of hydration and nickel sulfate with six. So it turns out a lot of sulfates are hydrated compounds. Because there's water stuck in the crystals, we have to pay attention to it because if we measure out samples of a hydrated ionic compound and try to, for example, get its mass, we're not only getting mass of the ionic compound, we're getting the mass of the water also. And what I want to do in, in today's video is perform a quick demonstration to show you how to figure out how many waters are in the, form, in the crystal and what's the formula of the hydrate. To start, I'm going to use this crucible. And this crucible is one that I'm not gonna to touch with my hands anymore because I already heated it in a Bunsen burner flame and let it cool to get rid of any oils or water vapor that might be stuck on this thing or in that residue here at the bottom. Lots of times crucibles are stained on the bottom from prior reactions and you just have to deal with it and just try not to let it bother you. And my crucible weighs 24.340 grams. And now I'm going to add some of my copper sulfate hydrate to my crucible. The exact amount I use does not matter as long as I know exactly how much this sample actually weighs. And I'll stop there and right now my crucible plus the hydrate now weighs 30.853 grams. So now that I know the weight of the copper sulfate hydrate in my crucible, I'm gonna go ahead and heat it over a Bunsen burner flame for a good 15 minutes. I'm actually hearing a little bit of the water evaporating, uh, sort of a sizzling, boiling sound, and the crystals are starting to turn white, which means that the water is starting to evaporate out. And now we can see that the crystals are almost completely white. It's been on here for almost 20 minutes, I let it go a few extra minutes, and uh, we'll turn off the heat now. And now after it's cooled, we'll check the mass of the crucible and the anhydrous compound, which is coming out to be 28.560. After I heated it, I found that the weight of the stuff inside the crucible was less than what it started as. And that makes sense to me, because if I'm driving off the water, whatever's left should weigh less. And we'll call that the anhydrous portion because it is without water now. But as a chemist, I have to ask myself the question, how do I know that I got all the water out of that stuff? What if there's water still in there that I just haven't driven out yet? How would I be able to tell that? How would I know that? One way that I can check to see if I got all the water out is by heating it again. And I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And by heating it again, I'll be able to tell after I mass it again, whether there was more water in there. If the mass continues to go down every time, 
then I know I still haven't driven off all the water and I'm driving off a little bit more and a little bit more. But if I get another mass that's the same as the mass that I had before, then I know that I must have gotten all the water out the first time. We call this heating to constant mass. And now after the second heating, we will check the mass again. And it looks like we're exactly at 28.560, which means we can be pretty confident that we got all the water out the first time. And now that I know the mass before heating and the masses after heating, I have enough information to calculate the formula of the hydrate. Let me show you how. All right, here's the data table that I made for my data. And if you're doing a lab like this, you should make a data table like this as well. We've got the mass of the crucible, the crucible plus the hydrate at the beginning, and then the masses after both heatings, we can see again that they're the same, which is uh, always a good thing when your masses agree. And um, to get started, we're gonna need to know the mass of the water that was driven off, and we'll also need to know the mass of the copper sulfate anhydrous that's left at the end. Now, a lot of people have trouble looking at a data table like this and choosing the correct values. To get the mass of the anhydrous stuff that's left at the end, this mass includes the crucible and the anhydrous. We want to subtract out the crucible. So you should take your fi final mass and your initial mass, and if you subtract those, you'll get the mass of the anhydrous. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. So we'll take 28.560 grams minus 24.340 grams. And that gives me 4.220 grams of copper sulfate. You always want to know the formula of the anhydrous part that you're working with. Next, we need the mass of the water that escaped. And that is just the difference between what it was before heating and after your second heating. So we need to take these two to get the weight of the water. So we'll go ahead and do that. So 30.853 grams minus 28.560 grams. And that gives me 2.293 grams of water. All right. So the next step to determining the chemical formula of our hydrate is to convert both of these into moles. I'm gonna go ahead and do it right in place here just to save room on my screen. And to convert them both to moles, we are going to divide them both by their molar masses. So according to the periodic table, one mole of copper sulfate has a molar mass of 159.61 grams. And if I do this divided by that, I will end up with 0.5. Two, six, that's supposed to be a two, 0 0.02643 moles of copper sulfate. And doing the same for water, I'm going to divide the mass of water by the molar mass of water, which is 18.01 grams. And in that case, I get 0 0.1273 moles of water. Then the last step is to take these two mole values and divide them both by the smaller one, which is usually the number of moles of the anhydrous compound because there's usually more waters than that in terms of moles. So let's go ahead and divide both of them by the smaller one, 0 0.02643. And that gives me a one for the copper sulfate. And for the water, 0 0.1273 moles divided by 0 0.02643 moles tap of my calculator gives me 4.816. Here's the bottle that my copper sulfate hydrate came from. And you can see on the label, it does say copper two sulfate. And then under here, it says pentahydrate. So it's cupric sulfate pentahydrate, and there's its formula, CUSO4.5H2Os. And those five waters add to the formula weight, which was normally 159, and now it's 249 because, again, those five waters that happen to be in the crystals with it. And so technically, the formula that I have figured out is CuSO4. The one essentially goes there. And we'll put a dot. And then I would have 4.816 waters. And this would be the formula that 
I got. This number here is a little bit low, probably due to the fact I didn't get all the water out, even though my mass is agreed. Maybe there were some little water molecules sort of hanging on in there um, that I didn't get out. So there you have it. How to calculate the number of waters in a hydrate. Thanks for watching and have a great day.